In 2003, as Director of Medical Services, he led the charge against the SARS epidemic. He then went on to serve as the President of the National University of Singapore for a decade. Today, as Singapore's Chief Health Scientist and as Chairman of the Committee of Government Scientific Advisors, he has been playing an instrumental role in our battle against COVID-19, the pandemic, that is. Professor Tan Cho Chuan, welcome to Inconvenient Questions. Welcome, Mr. Wan. Thanks uh, for having me on this interview. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure this is going to be uh, a very engaging interview. Now, and even as we speak, many of the other countries in Southeast Asia, in Asia, mm -hmm. are going through quite a bad patch as far as the epidemic is concerned. Hong Kong, South Korea, Japan, uh, Australia, the Philippines, you know, uh, they, they've been blindsided by the uh, by, by subsequent waves of the pandemic. Yet a few days ago, our Prime Minister, Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong, announced that Singapore is moving into phase three uh, on the 28th of this month, you know, and that uh, vaccinations are going to be made available e starting this month. Uh, and there was also the announcement that, that uh, Singapore is going to explore a uh, travel bubble with as many countries as possible. All this is well and good. It's great news uh, for Singapore uh, as far as the economy is concerned, as far as convenience is concerned. But there is also at the same time growing concern that maybe we are compromising safety in the process. Uh, is there any, any, any validity to that, that concern? Yeah, so first, uh, I think uh, you're right that uh, we are in a good position now in terms of uh, the very low levels of community transmission in Singapore and uh, that we are able to live life quite normally, albeit with some uh, restrictions. Uh, but you're also right that uh, all around the world, the situation is actually pretty serious in terms of epidemic spread, uh, not just in Southeast Asia, but uh, in the continuing epicenters for the pandemic, which are in the Americas and also to some extent in Europe. And uh, for us, uh, the uh, potential areas where we could have a new sources of outbreaks would be through importation. Yeah, but that, that's where the concern about the travel bubble liberation uh, yeah. is, is, is valid, isn't it? It is. And, uh, and yet uh, we know that it's quite likely that this pandemic in its current phase will last for quite some time, uh, at least for a year, perhaps two years. And uh, it is really not feasible or practical for Singapore to remain closed, essentially, for that long period of time. Uh, in the end, uh, we are a globally connected country. We rely a great deal on that global connectivity uh, to uh, thrive as a society and nation. And therefore, like in most things in this pandemic, it's an issue of balancing the risks against the needs and potential benefits and to be able to find a way to uh, mitigate the risks while trying to achieve the things that are important for us, not just in the long term, but actually in the short and medium term. Yep. So the reopening of Singapore has to occur, but it will have to occur in ways that are safe, that take into full account how we can manage the situation yep. in Singapore. Okay, so so I, I believe it is actually this, this, this positivity um, is linked to the availability of vaccinations. Uh, uh, I think it was a couple of days back or, or yesterday that you made the announcement to the media that uh, you imagine, you, you believe that Singapore needs about 80% of Singaporeans vaccinated before we can have the herd immunity effect. Uh, could you elaborate on that, please? Yes, I think we could think in terms of a number of stages that uh, vaccinations can help us achieve. Because uh, as we all know, the virus uh, spreads uh, quite in a quite a predictable fashion. And uh, there's one fundamental root cause, which is the fact that uh, the vast majority of the population in Singapore and around the world have no immunity against this infection. Mm. And so whatever we do, uh, we are just trying to stave off uh, being exposed. But the fact is that uh, most of us remain susceptible to infection. So the main way in which we can reduce this risk 
is uh, to develop immunity. And the presence now of at least one vaccine that is effective in conferring immunity would offer us an opportunity to uh, increase the immune status of our population. But uh, why, why 80 percent, Chuan? Yeah. That seems a pretty start, high figure. Uh, and we should start uh, thinking about it in a certain uh, pattern. That firstly, uh, because of uh, the way we have to roll out the vaccines, we will uh, initially have to protect healthcare workers. And if you think about what is the reason why uh, the uh, impact of uh, the pandemic has been so severe, it has uh, revolved around a few things. Uh, the first is uh, the health system gets overwhelmed. Therefore, the health system is unable to provide adequate care, not just for patients with COVID infection, but for all types of causes. So if we are able to extend uh, vaccination to healthcare workers, people who work in health facilities, we markedly reduce the likelihood that the health system will be taken down through infection. And therefore we protect that capacity to look after people. Then if we start to think about the next group, which are the vulnerable population, the elderly, those with chronic diseases that make them more susceptible to the severe infection, if you're able to protect them, then the amounts of um, uh, severe disease uh, or mortality will also be markedly reduced. And uh, this would then make the disease much less severe overall and would allow us to uh, continue without having a, a great deal of morbidity and mortality and also preserving a health system. Yeah. So, and and yeah. finally, when we go beyond that, if we're able to then vaccinate uh, the wider uh, population, that will be really important because there will be some individuals who are not uh, suitable for a vaccination right now or are not able to take the vaccination. And to protect them, we need to have an adequate percentage of our population hmm. to be immune so that they get indirectly protected from infection themselves. Right. So, so it's going to be done in, in, in stages. Uh, and, and these priorities have already been determined. Am I correct? Yes, and it's not just a matter of priorities, but uh, the consequences of vaccination on mitigating the risks. Right. And, uh, so when we think about the priority groups, they also reflect how we hope to be able to blunt the most serious impacts of the epidemic yeah. uh, sequentially. But eventually, of course, what we like is to have a situation where there's sufficient immunity in our general population so that we won't have uh, significant size outbreaks. Also. Right, right. So it's, it's like concentric circles, right? You start with the, with the, with the center. Where, where the impact on the others is pretty strong and then, and then you start moving out. Yes, because eventually I think we are not going to be able to eradicate this virus. It's going to be with us for a long time. Uh, but we, if, if the impact of infection is markedly reduced, then yeah. it will not be as severe as it is now. It will become more like uh, one of the regular infections, maybe a mild form of flu. Right. If we can move ourselves towards that, then of course it'll be much easier to deal with. Yeah. Now, eighty percent is is a very uh, significant number target. Uh, anecdotally speaking, you know, I, I I've been talking to people, people I know, my family members, my friends. Uh, I can tell you, strangely, there's a lot. There seems to be a lot of resistance. I would say that uh, six, seven out of ten people I speak to, uh, able-bodied individuals in their forties, fifties. Uh, all saying, no, they don't, they, 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 they don't want to do it. And many of them say, well, you know, maybe at best I will do it after I watch and observe how others are faring. Now, at, at this rate, I don't know how we're going to reach that 80% target that you're talking about. What appears to, what seems to be the primary concerns uh, based on your understanding, your reading of the picture, primary concerns that Singaporeans are having about this? Yes, I think it's a really important point. And uh, there are a few issues I think at play here. The first is uh, uh, people worry because this is a new vaccine. It's been uh, developed and approved in a very, very short time frame uh, for a variety of uh, good reasons. And uh, so people worry about the efficacy and safety. And uh, what we have to really do 
is to uh, continually share in a transparent manner uh, data which are science-based and evidence-informed uh, so that we are able to engage uh, the wider community and to uh, persuade individuals in the community that the vaccine is indeed safe and efficacious. I think that's really important. What's the difference between safe and efficacious? So efficacious refers to the ability to protect uh, the individual who is vaccinated. So in the case of the Pfizer BioNTech, uh, if you take a vaccine, then you have a 95% chance of developing immunity. And that immunity reduces uh, your likelihood of getting symptomatic infection. So efficacy is equal to protection. Safety is uh, side effects. And uh, there are two broad types of side effects. Uh, one which are the more immediate ones, such as uh, pain at the injection site, fever, swelling, headaches. And uh, for those, uh, for the Pfizer vaccine, they are common, but severe side effects are uncommon, less than 5%. And they usually would just last for a couple of days. They are self-limiting. Uh, so, so, so all this talk, uh, George Wan, uh, of long-term uh, debilitation, uh, things like neurological impact um, uh, and, and, re and reduced strength of the immunity, things like that have been circulating. Uh, any, any strength in those arguments? So from the data we've seen so far from uh, the phase three trials in uh, Pfizer, which are very large, 44,000 individuals, the sort of uh, serious side effects, so not the side effects like pain in the arm or the injection, but mm. the serious ones, are uh, actually very low and uh, about the same rate as the placebo arm, 0.6%. And uh, we have not uh, identified in these studies uh, serious causes for concern. Of course, we would need to monitor as the vaccinations are rolled out, but as of the data that we have today, uh, there is uh, good evidence of safety in the sense that uh, the likelihood of uh, severe long-term side effects is very low. The, the, but it's very important for us uh, to emphasize this point that we have to balance it against the risk of getting infected with COVID-19, which even in young people can result in fairly severe acute illness, and in some cases, longer-term sequelae. So it's not any long what, What's that? Uh, what was that you said? Uh, you longer know, term. Some of the people who get infected may have uh, long-term problems with uh, breathing. Uh, some of them may have to be tired uh, for long periods of time. Uh, so the... Because, because the structure of the lungs changes, is it? Is that true? Yeah, the consequences of infection, even in the young, can be quite uh, long-lasting. So we have to balance up uh, the uh, potential risk of a vaccination against the risk that we know of uh, that come from COVID-19 infection. So I think one uh, cause for hesitancy amongst the population is uh, that this um, vaccine is new, was developed very quickly. I think another uh, potential um, factor at play is that people feel safe. Uh, the, the transmission rate in Singapore is relatively low, and therefore uh, people feel there may not be a pressing need for, uh, for them to get uh, vaccinated. The, the, not just the transmission, the, the death rate is also very, very, it's 29 as it stands, uh, exceptionally low. low, you know. But so that, that's people, giving this... Yeah, but I mean what we've learned, uh, you know, uh, repeatedly from uh, this epidemic as it plays on different countries, is that, uh, you know, you think you have controlled the infections, and uh, the nature of human interaction is so complex that the virus eventually finds a way and uh, creates a new way of infections. Yeah, and, and then so, we're already seeing that happening in, in, in other parts of Asia, right? South Korea, Hong Kong, Japan. The world. And therefore, yeah. the, uh, we must not get a false sense of security that just because we contain it now, that this is going to persist uh, uh, infinitely. It, it will not be like that. There will be an ever-present threat of uh, future outbreaks, and these outbreaks, if you are unlucky, can become big. And uh, that would not be the right time to start thinking about vaccination, because the vaccines take uh, 21 days apart, two shots, and then you need a couple of weeks after that to develop protection. Mm. So if you want to wait till 
the uh, epidemic is uh, uh, very obvious to everybody. It's too late. It's too late. What, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing, Chochon, sorry, is it's not just an individual decision, right? I mean, honestly, the way I see it, uh, and, and each individual's decision is going to have an impact on how society actually moves forward in our battle against COVID. <clears throat> Because if we do not, if each individual decides on his own that I don't want to do it, I'm going to wait for someone else to do it first. Uh, we're not going to hit that, that herd immunity target that you're talking about, if not 80, not even 70. You know? And if you don't do that, it's going to come back to hit us because our, our life is not going to get back. Our chances of getting back to normal are, are going to be pushed down further. Uh, yes, I mean, that's the way I see it. Yes, indeed. Uh, this one, I think that's a very good point. That uh, First, we want to protect ourselves. And uh, I mean, the vaccine now gives us an opportunity to do so. And while protecting ourselves, if enough of us in Singapore get vaccinated, then we will achieve herd immunity, by which I mean that uh, sufficient numbers in our population are protected. And this indirectly reduces the risk that those who are unable to get vaccinated, they too will get protected because they will be less susceptible to infection. So in that way, we won't just be benefiting ourselves, we would be protecting the wider community, including our loved ones, yeah. and including those who are not able or suitable to have the vaccine. And, and that also allows us to open up our, our, our borders, right? I mean we can be a lot more confident about people coming in because we are immune. We, can, we are also going to be a lot more confident and comfortable traveling to other countries because we are vaccinated. Uh, you know, all, all these things also add up because if we don't do it as individuals or collectively, then we will pay a price. Uh, and as you said, it's a risk benefit analysis. So I, I guess what I'm hearing from you is it's no more just as simple as my personal choice, my personal liberty. Uh, it's also something that we need to consider how our personal choices and decisions are going to impact uh, on, on society as a whole. Uh, another quick question. Uh, th this is another reason why people are concerned. In the, in the USA, which is often used as a benchmark, right? From what I understand, for any pharmaceutical products to gain uh, approval by FDA, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the process takes about 13 years from what I understand, right? In this particular case, the process has taken about a, about a year. Now, that's, that's quite alarming. You know, how, how are you able to do this? And there's, a, there's the assumption, of course, a reasonable assumption that we might be cutting corners just to get the vaccine out. How would you respond to that as, as a medical practitioner and a scientist? So this, so that's a very good point, but I just want to make a comment to your earlier remark that uh, vaccination will allow us to open up safely. And just to say that that's completely true, and the alternative is we'll have to try to seal ourselves off for a long time yeah. uh, just to uh, hermetically prevent any imported cases, which is not going to be feasible and it's not going to be good for ourselves, our families, or Singapore as a whole. Yeah. Uh, you raise a very important point, which is uh, how is it possible that a vaccine could be developed so quickly? And I think there are three uh, important things that have changed, which has made it possible. Uh, the first relates to the science. We had the advantage uh, that uh, scientists have been working on uh, developing effective vaccines against the SARS virus in 2003, as well as the MERS uh, virus uh, later on. And therefore, uh, a lot of uh, prior scientific work had been done and a lot of very powerful new science platforms have been created. So when uh, COVID-19 hit us, uh, we were able really to move very quickly because of all this prior work on uh, coronaviruses. It uh, allowed a very substantial uh, acceleration of uh, the development of a vaccine for this related coronavirus. So that's one very important part. The second very important piece is the way in which clinical trials have been done. And what has uh, been previously uh, in sequence type of uh, activity, meaning you finish uh, a phase one trial, take two years, get approved, then you do a phase two study with some more patients, 
to show safe, uh, that it works. That takes another two years. Then you do a phase three trial with yeah. more patients to show efficacy. That will take several years. Uh, what has been done in this pandemic has been to overlap these different phases. So the same number of uh, patients are being studied. In fact, a larger number of patients are being studied. 40,000 40, I hear for, 40, for Pfizer. And um, that, but the, the overlap allows them to uh, uh, move much faster. And the, the size of the studies are, are, is large because of the a wide amount of uh, infection going on. So the Pfizer study had uh, 44,000 uh, people in it of whom uh, half uh, were patients who were given the vaccine. Just a quick, quick check. Uh, the normal, normal test, I mean, it's not, not this epidemic, not, not this pandemic, uh, uh, FDA, not normal test, how many people are usually surveyed? It's generally in the range of about 3,000 or 4,000 patient participants. Okay, okay. Uh, so we have a, a very substantially larger group that uh, is being studied in this uh, pandemic. So the second uh, reason is that the clinical trials are happening much faster because they're being overlapped and they are uh, being done, uh, they can accrue patients much faster because uh, there are so many patients. Uh, but I want to stress that the rigor of the studies remains. Uh, the endpoints, that means what are you trying to achieve with the vaccination are defined beforehand. Uh, the studies are carrying out double blind, meaning that we don't know whether the, the individual participant is on a vaccine or a placebo arm, and the data are monitored by independent safety and monitoring board. So the rigor and objectivity of the clinical trials is uh, completely and consistently assured. And the final thing, which is really very important, is uh, the at-risk financing. Yeah. At-risk financing. Because uh, a lot of the impediments uh, to the rapid development is that uh, you won't want to start manufacturing until you are very confident that uh, you, you have approval. Yeah. Because otherwise you run a high risk of losing money. Yeah. But at-risk financing means that uh, even before the clinical trials have been completed, uh, manufacturers were already manufacturing vaccines. That's right. And uh, that has become possible because of a higher degree of risk sharing. By the, by the governments. A lot uh, of the governments have government, put in the money. Uh, by governments, very substantially. But uh, in the vaccine development, considerable risk sharing was done through uh, non-profit organizations like the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. That's, that's, uh, that's uh, COVAX. Uh, no, this is CEPI, Coalition CEPI. for yeah. Epidemic Preparedness in Innovation. It's a not-for-profit that includes uh, some government donations, the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, uh, that pulled together funds, which were then used to support the rapid development of uh, vaccines. So the Moderna uh, vaccine, for example, received uh, a substantial uh, support uh, from CEPI uh, quite early in its development. Yeah. And but, this but I, I, development I, I, to proceed much faster. I believe all of this comes under COVAX, right? And and uh, and Covax is is administered by WHO World Health Organization. And Covax stands for COVID nineteen vaccines global access, from what I understand. And how involved have uh, has Singapore been with uh, WHO and Covax in 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 working uh, together with uh, I think it's a coalition of one hundred eighty four countries. Uh, interestingly, USA and, and Russia are not members of this coalition. Uh, how involved have we been, Singapore? in this because global effort. We're very involved in this, uh, uh, but just to make a point that the at-risk uh, financing is somewhat separate from yeah. COVAX. COVAX yeah. uh, at-risk financing is to help accelerate the development and the manufacturing of uh, vaccines. And that's often done at the local level. And that's done by governments, by yeah. international organizations. COVAX is a multilateral platform, uh, which is quite new, uh, that uh, brings together countries uh, to collectively purchase uh, vaccines. And uh, there are two main sets of countries, one which are uh, countries which are self-financing. Uh, so Singapore is a self-financing country. And uh, here we will pool our uh, purchasing 
together with other self-financing countries so that we can buy a larger portfolio of uh, vaccines, which will then be distributed equitably. And then the second group will be countries uh, which are recipients of uh, vaccines which are uh, funded and donated by other countries. And uh, so this entire two groups make up uh, the COVAX facility. Right. Uh, Singapore has been very involved in a number of ways. Uh, at the early uh, period when COVAX was being conceptualized and being uh, discussed, uh, Singapore, in our, through our High Commission in Geneva, set up the Friends of the COVAX facility, which we mm -hmm. co-chaired with Switzerland. That's right. And this was really to bring together on a voluntary basis countries which uh, were like-minded and wanted to support this multilateral platform. And what we did was to share information and to generate wider support for the COVAX facility. Were you, in, were you personally involved in these? Uh, yes, uh, myself and uh, Chairman of EDB, Bae Suan Jin, uh, were very much involved in this. Uh, we are the Singapore co-chairs, along with um, our Swiss uh, counterparts. So, so how have we struck a, a, a good balance between national interests? I mean, I guess that's priority, right? We've got to make sure that our national interests, our own citizens, PRs, get access to these vaccines. How do we balance that with, with multilateral and global interests? I, I think that they're actually part of uh, the same uh, effort because it is only by helping others that we will help ourselves. So let me explain what I mean. Uh, so uh, we are very uh, happy that we've been able to secure enough doses for the entire population in Singapore. Uh, this will enable us to vaccinate uh, those uh, living in Singapore, as the Prime Minister had uh, announced. At the same time, through uh, working with COVAX and other multilateral uh, initiatives, we uh, hope to um, support the equitable access of vaccines for countries around the world. And this is very important because if uh, we were able to vaccinate across in countries across the world, we can then reduce the burden and impact of uh, the pandemic much more sharply than if we just had a small number of rich countries vaccinate their populations. Uh, you will get a much greater impact if uh, the vaccines were more widely available and uh, vaccination proceeded across the world. Right. And by doing that, if the pandemic acute phase around the world can be much better contained more quickly, then this will be beneficial for Singapore. It will be beneficial for the world. And so it can be, and it should be a win-win situation. Right. We protect our population, but we contribute to the rest of the world becoming protected. And then the whole world can then proceed uh, back to a much more normal way of working. Right. We are running out of time. So I just have, a, I, want to, I want to squeeze in a couple of questions. They're quite important. Uh, you know, everything that you said just now, Cho I mean, you're a scientist, you're a medical practitioner, doctor. Uh, people say, well, obviously he would, he would promote this because he was involved in the process and he would say everything is safe. Uh, at the end of the day, what is it that would make people of a country, citizens like Singapore, make that, make that decision? It's not, a, it's not an easy decision to make because it affects you, your children, uh, to go for the vaccination. What do you think? You know, uh, I, I, would, I would suggest that public trust is actually very important. You know, uh, when we see uh, Minister Lawrence Wong, uh, you know, come up and talk, he's very persuasive, you know, but at the same time, he's not a medical, he's not a scientist, you know. Uh, would you say that we probably need to see a lot more of people in the scientific community standing up, credible people in the scientific community standing up and giving their objective assessment? Yes, uh, absolutely critical. I think public trust is really important because this is a pandemic occurring during a social media era. Yeah. And therefore, the amount of uh, information and disinformation going around is tremendous. There's so much information that many people have difficulty following. And uh, it's also not easy to understand many of the things that are being discussed. So I would say that uh, trust is really critical. Trust is underpinned uh, by a few very important things. One is a clear, honest communication and transparency, sharing uh, what the science knows 
and what is still unknown, that we shouldn't try to uh, paper things over. We should be honest and transparent, and this is an ongoing effort. And uh, as you rightly say, uh, the scientists, the public health experts, uh, the clinicians uh, have to contribute very actively to this engagement of the public. And uh, as we are seeing now in Singapore, this is already happening. So, so trust, I think, is really critical and open, transparent uh, communications is the key of it. Second part is a belief in our institutions that uh, fundamentally, when the Health Sciences Authority, which is a regulator, reviews uh, the data, uh, they are doing it with the highest degree of professionalism and honesty that, uh, that when they say that the vaccine uh, is authorized for pandemic special access route to be used in Singapore, that it is indeed safe. And uh, so this is a very critical thing and I'm very uh, proud of uh, our colleagues in the Health Sciences Authority that uh, they work extremely professionally and they uh, look at the data very, very closely before they come to a conclusion. And then I think the third piece is really about the examples that we set because people can hear what you're saying but they also look to see what we'll be doing and uh, I would say that uh, uh, it's really good uh, that uh, our political leaders have already said that they will be taking the vaccines early. We are seeing this around the world. And if you ask me personally, I would take a vaccine too. Yeah. Because I think then that would be, in a small way, um, us demonstrating that we believe what we are talking about. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you know, these, these decisions while they're personal, they do have an impact on us as a collective, as the people. So we have to look at it from that perspective. And I think this public trust factor is very important. So far, I think the, the government of Singapore, the civil servants, as well as the political leaders have earned much public trust, you know, but that public trust can dissipate as fast as it's, it's there. Right. And that's why constant communication, not only from the political leaders, but also from members of the scientific community is actually very, very important. We need to continue to feel and what you said earlier on was very important that the government will continue to continue to assess the situation because it can turn and whether we have the honesty and the integrity to go back on our decision to cancel our process when we find that something is not as assumed, you know, and this is the final thing I'd like to say. George Tran, I've known you for a long time. You know, uh, you look much older than I, but we are the same age. Um, and I've always seen you as a person who is credible, above board, almost to a fault. And, um, and whatever you say matters to me. Thank you very much for joining me on Inconvenient Questions, George Tran. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vespa. It's so kind of you to say that. Uh, we are in an unprecedented time with an unprecedented crisis. And I think all of us uh, are working very hard. Uh, many, many people across Singapore are working extremely hard to bring this crisis to an end. And I think the vaccine offers us a really unique opportunity to do so uh, in a very fundamental way. So thanks so much for having me. And it's uh, such a pleasure to be able to talk with you again. Thank you. And I say credible. You're a very credible person, even though you went to St. Joseph's Institution and not RI. <laughs> See you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.